Hello, this is Rob Massey, and welcome back to the Planet Jesus podcast. This is the show for skeptics and Christians who want to learn more about the Bible and understand better how to interpret and apply it. This is episode 8, Prince of Peace. In this episode, we will look at the idea of peace and consider how Jesus modeled and guaranteed our ultimate peace. I hope you enjoyed this program. When I was in the seventh grade, I remember reviewing the number of bombs, tanks, and troops each nation maintained. It struck fear in me to see that the Russians had so many more weapons and troops. During my sophomore year of high school, Red Dawn, the movie, was produced, starring Patrick Swayze and Charlie Sheen. My friends and I would watch that movie on a Saturday afternoon and dream about how we'd respond to invasion. Running to the hills with camping supplies and guns until we could return to wreak havoc on the occupiers. Last year, Amazon Video released an alternate reality program titled Man in the High Castle. In the series' alternate timeline, the Axis powers have won World War II when the Germans dropped an atomic bomb on Washington, D.C. The Reich controlled the eastern United States and the Empire of Japan occupied the western United States. There was also an uneasy neutral zone around the Rocky Mountains where insurgents huddled. I bring those illustrations up to kind of reflect on how we as humans are storytellers. We are mimetic creatures and will mirror the behaviors of others, even if the others are characters in a story. Man, I was Patrick Swayze. I was 15 years old. I was mad at the Russians for something that only happened in a movie. I would have been okay to lose to the Jamaican bobsled team, but I didn't want the U.S. to lose to Russia. Back to my 7th grade social studies revelation. When I saw how many nuclear bombs, or maybe it is better to use the term we applied during the Second Gulf War, weapons of mass destruction, I realized that in 1979 we had enough destructive power to destroy most of the human race. Now, my dad was a paratrooper and a bouncer in a bar, so he was an advocate for strong national defense. He would see the nuclear disarmament protest groups like Greenpeace on the news and express his belief that they were traitors, and some of them may have been. His narrative for peace was peace from a position of strength. If I heard him say that once, I heard him say it a dozen times. Where anti-nuclear groups believed in peace through peace. Of course, uh, that has its own elegance. Peace through peace makes, makes more sense. But only if everyone's playing the same game. You try to play peace when somebody else is playing war. It gets a little dicey. In the eighth grade, I had that opportunity. A bully targeted me. His name, and you always remember the names of bullies, was Tim Riley. I hope you're out there, Tim, and I hope your life is better. Sorry I didn't always behave best by you. Every day he would harass me, knock the books out of my hand, steal my clarinet. I know what you're thinking. You were in a band and you played the clarinet. You deserve to be picked on. I tried piece through piece. You know, that self-deprecating humor, laughing it off when surrounded by laughing teens. And by the way, Is there anything more treacherous than a middle school mob? None of my peace through peace worked. Finally, at the dinner table one night, my dad said, If you want to stop the bullying, you've got to knock that kid down. You need to start punching him and don't let up until somebody breaks it up. Dad was all shock and awe. Mom, on the other hand, was, Harvey, promoting fighting is not the answer. Rob will get in trouble. You know the one who throws the punch first. He's the one who gets in trouble. My dad responded, how many fights you've been in, Bonnie? Shockingly, she responded, well, none. He turned to me and said, who are you going to listen to, Rob? In an amateur fight, the one who hits first usually wins. Rob, I want you to hit that guy and don't stop hitting him until somebody breaks it up. Dad's peace through strength made sense that night. And the next day, it worked. I beat up Tim Riley that day. It was so funny sitting in his face all blotchy with my blows while we sat in the counselor's office. 
I had to muffle a chuckle. I had put up with that kid's abuse so long and just to think it was so easy to get it to stop. Creating peace through strength is effective and it's intuitive. There has never been a world power in all of history that has not obtained its position from military strength. But my mother and the nuclear disarmament approach of peace through peace seems to possess its own logic. If the means of destroying each other were removed, then mutually assured destruction would be avoided. Of course, since this is the Planet Jesus podcast, I may posit another option. Nuanced and not as obvious, but intuitive once examined. It was Jesus' approach to peace. The problems at the macro level are more complex than at the micro level. Just as an invasion by the Russians in the 1980s or a German victory during World War II would have had greater impact than my fight with Tim Riley. But that's what's interesting about the life of Jesus. It was lived at the micro level, small villager, insignificant family, itinerant rabbi. But his life and words struck a nerve across the political and social spectrum, bringing both Rome and Jerusalem down on him. Let's take a look at some of the biblical thoughts on peace and see what conclusions we can draw. In the Hebrew scriptures, uh, Isaiah, the prophet, in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7, has something to say about the replacement of violence with peace. But before we read Isaiah 9, we need to understand what the nation of Israel was going through. King Uzziah, a beloved king who had reigned for many years, he had died. This was destabilizing and opened the country up to potential attacks from the growing power of Assyria just north of them. There were a succession of good and bad kings, lots of turmoil. So with that in mind, let's read what Isaiah tried to encourage the people with. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness... On them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it, with justice and with righteousness, From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Oswald, in his commentary on Isaiah, writes, When every human attempt to bring light has failed, then God will bring light, not because he must, not because human craft has discovered the key to force him, but merely out of his own grace. The rebellion of the Jewish leaders, and at times the people themselves, led to this national crisis. But they were going to have an increase in joy, despite the trouble. Their joy was going to return to them. Joy is the natural response when one goes from occupation to freedom. Although the succession of hostilities would allow them to return to their fields and their harvests would increase, Isaiah talks about the joy in comparison to how they feel with a good harvest. Isaiah uses the simile as to say what kind of joy they'd have. Their joy would be from an absence of oppression, not the fact that they had grain and food again, although that was essential. But it was that they felt the sense of liberation and They realized that God would fulfill his promises, the promises that he had made to their forefathers. Not so much the material blessings, although that's not excluded. 
Verses 4 and 5 talk about the elimination of the rod of the oppressor and the trampling of the warrior's battle boot. But who or what would fill this vacuum of power and authority? Would it be just dystopian dog-eat-dog? No, verses 6 and 7 says that a child would be born to the family of David that would be a prince of peace and that his government of peace would not be limited by time or space. Notice he writes that there will be no end to the influence of his throne, that space, and that it would extend from, quote, this time forth and forevermore, end quote. That's time. It is a kingdom of peace, but also of justice. Justice implies some conflict. I'm not suggesting war, but direct speech and actions in the face of injustice. Let's look at Isaiah's words a few chapters later in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. But before we dig into them, it's helpful to remember Isaiah's last words from the previous chapter. That's chapter 10, verse 34. That's where Assyria, due to its violent tendencies, would be cut down like a tree. So, with that image in mind, we will begin to read chapter 11. Okay, chapter 11, verse 11. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from the roots shall bear fruit. Remember, mutually assured destruction leaves a field of stumps, whether you are Assyria or the family of King David. But the prophet is saying that a descendant of David's lineage would bring new hope to the nation. We'll see as we read more, not only the nation of Israel, that this hope of David would bring, but also to the world. So let's continue. Verse 2. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what he sees or decide disputes by what he hears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor. Not like me and my high school buddies, who could not see past our national pride. Let's continue. And he'll decide with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. Notice that the weapon of his choice would be words of wisdom, counsel, and knowledge. Let's continue. And with the breath of his lips, he shall kill the wicked. Again, The wicked are killed by words. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf, and the lion, and the fattened calf together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like an ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. See, the scriptures don't cover up the fact that there are predators and prey in the world, only that under the influence of the promises of the king, Each nature would be changed so that cohabitation would be possible. I I love the phrase, they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. That's a great promise. Let's continue. Verse 10. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples. Now here, a signal is like a rallying flag. The king would become a rallying point for the people of God but not for them only. Notice what he says in the next verse. Of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. In that day the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time to recover the remnant that remains of his people, from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, And from the coastlands of the sea, he will raise a signal for the nations and will assemble the banished of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Look at 
This king would be a king for both Israel and the nations. What an amazing promise. So Isaiah is saying, despite the turmoil, pending destruction from the global superpower, the turnover of kings and all the economic hardship that results from that kind of destabilization, the world could hope in a wise, peace-driven king who would expand his kingdom through the words he spoke. Let's look at a Christian reflection on peace. Last week on my flight home from New York City, I read some of the prayers from the Book of Common Prayer used by the Anglican Church. There were two evening prayers that stood out to me relative to peace. The first reads, O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that both our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee, we being defended from fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. This prayer claims that it is the good counsel of God that we can be defended from the fear of our enemies. We will never be free of enemies, per se, but we can stop fearing them. When I think of any conflict I become embroiled in, it comes down to me fearing something, If we believe the Hebrew narrative of a king who would bring peace, which the writer of this prayer seemed to believe, then we can be free from fear despite our current circumstances. The second prayer reads, Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night, for the love of thy only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, Amen. The foundation for Christian peace is the hope that Jesus will save and protect. This salvation goes beyond a warm internal feeling of acceptance or saying the sinner's prayer. It's not a formula. It's a reality. It extends to a promise that whatever occurs, the king will vindicate you. Perils and dangers will come to everyone. But the promise from God is that that is not the final answer. Justice will prevail. And by justice, don't think retribution on your enemies, but renewal and rectification, the setting of all things to being right again. The writers of these prayers are simply mirroring what they were taught in the words of earlier Christian authors. For example, Luke records the preaching of Peter in Acts 10. In this chapter, there was a Roman centurion named Cornelius. Now, a Roman centurion had about 100 soldiers that reported up to him. This man, Cornelius, reverenced the God of the Jews. He heard about Peter and sent for him to come and talk to him and those in his household. Let's pick up reading in verse 28. And Peter said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then why you sent for me. First, it is important to recognize that God is breaking down the hostility between Jews and non-Jews. God still wants to break down hostilities between all peoples. That breaking down, however, has to occur in the disciples of Jesus first. After Cornelius responded to Peter with the backstory on why Peter was sent for, Peter replies in verse 34, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. The revelation that Peter received that day was that God does not show partiality. Anyone who does right, that word means to be just. We might use the word righteous, but that gets lost too. It's a just person, a person who acts justly. Anyone who does right will be accepted. Also notice that good news, what Christians call the gospel, that Jesus' priest was called, quote, 
good news of peace, end quote. You know what I didn't know when I fought Tim Riley, that God loved him. I wasn't mature enough or familiar enough with the character of Jesus to look for creative ways to navigate my situation. This lamb was lying next to the lion and the lion was licking his lips. Even now, with the knowledge of the character and the promises of Jesus, I allow myself to be carried away by fear. A situation at work, the threatenings of a co-worker, the fear of being exposed as an imposter, all still plague me. I desire to keep my family secure, so I need a job. And in moments of weakness, I give in to the fear and forget to rely on the wisdom and the counsel of the prince who has a message of peace. And instead, I respond or I react or I return in kind. Let's look at another passage. It comes from the Gospel of John. It's found in both chapter 7 and in chapter 20. So let's start in John chapter 7, verse 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. There is a lot here in Jesus' words and the timing of his words, but we don't have time to review them now. What I want you to see is that Jesus claims that he is the source of all our thirsts or our desires. His spirit is like water that will flow from him through us and into the world. Now let's read John 20 verses 21 through 23. Here Jesus has died and is now resurrected. John writes, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. This acted out parable shows that Jesus is like God when he breathed into Adam the breath of life and Adam became a living soul. The disciples of Jesus were receiving life. Other Christian authors call it new creation. And this spirit of the new creation enables us to forgive. We have the power to forgive or not forgive. But when we consider the forgiveness that's been extended to us, what should our default be as Christians? My mom had it partially correct. Peace comes from peacemakers. Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, the merciful, and the peacemakers, for they are the children of God. These seem like positions of weakness. But it seems to me that Jesus showed amazing strength when he withstood with words the injustice of the religious and political powers of his day. They used their weapons against him and he used his words against them. Let's consider who won the battle. The followers of Christ. Now, I know that all those who claim Jesus don't follow his pattern of living, but stay with me on this one. Christians in the world today number 2.3 billion globally, over 31% of the world's population. How many followers are there of Caesar today? Now, you might argue, well, you know, you've got all your followers of Trump and of Putin and of, you know, name your, name your power guy or gal, and they're out there. And there's people that worship that, and we're, that's, a, that's a whole nother podcast. But my point is, is that Jesus still has people that espouse what he believed and lived. So whether we're talking about national threats or personal conflict, Christians can maintain inner peace by remembering that Jesus is the king and his method, although personally risky, has resulted in a lot of good. Hospitals, charities, orphanages. When the Christian faith is lived, the results are world-changing. When Christians leverage the tools and the methods of Caesar or the religious hierarchy— then the results are just as or more destructive. But let's be at peace. 
knowing that God is playing the long game in an effort to save all. When we go into work on Monday, let's forgive. When we go into school, let's forgive. We can still have a voice against bullies, but it needs to be seasoned with grace and love. Let's follow the example of God and play the long game. Maybe you are his agent to help others realize that they are accepted and that he shows no favoritism, that they can be included in God's plan for rectifying the world. Thank you for listening. There are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, and you could have chosen any, but I sincerely appreciate your investment of time into mine. The show notes for this and all episodes and other links to source material can be found on my website at planetjesus.net. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate it, and share it with a friend. Thanks again.